Arguably, the scientific revolution began in 1514 with Copernicus, who rejected the complexity of ancient astronomy that insisted on placing the Earth at the center of the universe. He put it instead in its proper place as revolving around the sun. This changed our view of the universe as a kind of machine that followed precise laws and that had order. And if these laws were understood properly, motions and events could be predictable. This was the foundation of scientific thought for centuries. However, early in the 20th century, this idea of a predictable universe was turned on its head. You might say this was the second scientific revolution. It's a revolution we are still coming to terms with. It's the idea that at its core, the universe is a quantum universe, that it is made up of discrete bits of mass and energy that we call particles, that are interacting via quantized fields mediated by other particles. The remarkable thing is that these bits of mass and energy are so small that we can't directly see them, only detect them using advanced instruments. And some, like quarks, are not even directly detectable. So the question is, how do we really know that they're even there? What makes us so sure? What led us to the idea that the universe must be quantized? And what would happen if the universe was not quantized? Join me as we try to answer those questions coming up right now. Before we dive deep into the quantized world, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Magellan TV. The documentary that got me thinking about making this video is called Secrets of the Universe, Greatest Scientists in Their Own Words. It tells the story of some of the greatest physicists of the 20th century who made some of the most remarkable discoveries in quantum mechanics and cosmology, including their personal struggles and rivalries. You'll find thousands of fascinating documentaries like this on Magellan TV. It's a new kind of streaming documentary service from the filmmakers themselves. Featured subjects include history, nature, science, and technology. You can watch it on any of your devices anytime without any ads. If you sign up for Magellan using the link in the description, you'll get a free one-month trial. I highly recommend Magellan TV, so be sure to click the link in the description. Classical mechanics championed by Isaac Newton around 1665 had solved the problem of the solar system and reduced nearly all mechanical phenomena in the heavens and earth to a single powerful equation, F equals ma. Later, classical physics appeared to culminate in the discovery by James Clerk Maxwell that a changing electric flux would produce a magnetic field. So by the end of the 19th century, the combined theories of mechanics by Newton and electromagnetism by Maxwell seemed to explain so many phenomena that some were even ready to declare that pretty much anything that we could ever learn from physics had more or less already been learned. This was a classical world. Classical physics is continuous. This means you can always keep dividing things into smaller pieces. Pour yourself a glass of water, then pour half of that into two smaller cups. Now split the water in these two cups into four cups and continue. You can keep doing this in the classical picture. There is no limit. The concept of continuity may seem obviously wrong today, but back then this was thought to be how things worked. The concepts of particles like photons existed, but these particles could have any continuous amount of energy. Today, we of course know that water is made from molecules, and eventually you'll end up with just one molecule, which you can't split any further without changing its essential properties. Scientists soon realized that classical physics had some major flaws because certain phenomena could not be explained. For example, the color of a hot glowing body had to be explained. Why, you ask? As we know, every object emits some radiation. If you go into a room and turn off the light, it will be completely dark. But if I had an infrared camera, I could see you in the camera as your body will be emitting infrared light or heat according to your temperature. Objects that are much hotter start emitting more energetic visible light. A good example would be if you heat up a piece of metal up to a really high temperature, first it will become red, then yellow, then eventually white, as it can send out any color of visible light. In 1900, two scientists, Lord Rayleigh and James Jeans, had used experimental data to come up with a law of how black bodies emit electromagnetic radiation. The problem was that according to their theory, a black body will send out energy in any frequency range allowed by the temperature. And the hotter the object, the more frequencies became available, and the more energy would be emitted. This classical theory works fine for black body radiation at frequencies below the UV range, but for more energetic black body radiation in the UV range and beyond, 
the theory completely collapses because according to this theory, very hot objects should instantaneously radiate all their energy until they reach their minimum energy, around absolute zero. This is clearly not what happens. And this is why it is called the ultraviolet catastrophe. If you have a black body and sum the total amount of radiated energy, according to their formula, you find that the black body can release an arbitrary amount of energy. This would in principle cause matter to radiate away all its energy. The solution to this problem marked the end of the classical world and the beginning of the quantum world. This solution was actually already there when the ultraviolet catastrophe was coming to light. Because around the same time in 1900, Max Planck had come up with an equation to explain black body radiation. He had made the assumption, which seemed strange at the time, to treat electromagnetic radiation as being quantized. Thus, it was not continuous energy that matter released, but discrete quanta of energy. And thus, the emission of radiation was limited to quanta of energy proportional to a constant. This idea materialized as Planck's famous equation, E equals HF, where the quanta of energy E is equal to the frequency times Planck's constant. The introduction of this constant introduced a minimum discrete increment of energy. So energy couldn't be just any value. It had to be an integer multiple of Planck's constant. In the classical case, there would be a lot more energy radiated because the energies could be any value, not bound by integer multiples of Planck's constant. This dispatched physics straight from the classical world to the quantum world. And in this world, only specific discrete values of things like energy, momentum, spin, etc. were allowed. And consequently, you'll see this constant in just about all quantum equations today. This constant h is the symbol of this quantization. Another phenomenon that only quantum mechanics could explain was why an electron does not lose all its energy when orbiting a nucleus. In 1911, when Ernest Rutherford came up with the model of an atom as being electrons orbiting around a central nucleus, there was a big problem. If electrons orbit around the nucleus, then their circular motion means that they are constantly accelerating, since acceleration is any change in either speed or direction. An orbiting electron would be constantly changing direction, and so accelerating. The problem with an accelerating electron is that according to Maxwell's laws, the changing electric field means it must be emitting photons. And if it emits photons, it must be losing energy. This would mean that the electron would continuously lose its orbital energy and eventually hit the nucleus. But that's not what happens, because atoms exist, and they're usually stable. So what's going on? Niels Bohr came up with part of the answer. Only special orbits are allowed around the nucleus, where the angular momentum of the electron is a whole number multiple of Planck's constant, over 2 pi. So electrons are in fixed orbits according to their energy states. Light is only emitted or absorbed when electrons jump from one orbit to another. This is significant because it means that atoms as we understand them cannot form in classical physics. The orbits of electrons have to be quantized or they will not exist. Similarly, matter beyond a certain temperature would radiate away all its energy due to the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now, to fully grasp our quantized world, it isn't actual enough just to consider objects as being quantized. This was what we initially did, and this is the basis of the famous Schrodinger equation. The problem is that around the same time as Max Planck and other pioneers of quantum mechanics were rewriting physics books, a certain scientist by the name of Albert Einstein also decided to join in the destruction of the classical world. His theory of special relativity, and later general relativity, also completely changed the way we think of the world, but in a slightly different way. You can watch my videos on special and general relativity, but for this discussion, the problem related to quantum mechanics comes down to the fact that Einstein's brilliant new theory contained a statement along the lines of, the laws of physics are the same for any speed at which you are moving. Thus, no matter if you move at 10, 100, or 1 million kilometers per hour, the physics you experience should be the same. The problem here is that the first formulation of quantum mechanics does not take into account the speed of movement. Now, it becomes a problem if you work with things moving close to the speed of light, because then 
things start to get inaccurate. So we had to do the quantization of our world a bit better to fix this issue. The problem can be understood simply by looking at the Schrodinger equation. Einstein's theory of special relativity tells us that we must treat space and time equally to form a theory compatible with the space-time of relativity. If we look at the Schrodinger equation, we see that the space component is second order, the squared part, but the time component is first order. This equation explicitly doesn't treat space and time equally. It was only a few years later that Paul Dirac managed to fix this issue. And in his equation, both the space part and the time part are first order. So they satisfy relativity. The equation he came up with was the famous Dirac equation, which was the first quantum field theory equation of motion. Note that it wasn't the first quantum mechanical equation to satisfy relativity, but it is arguably the most important. This led to the so-called second quantization. In practice, what these equations do is instead of quantizing objects, they quantize fields. And this gave rise to quantum field theory, or QFT. And it was a new quantum theory that incorporated the idea of quantization while respecting Einstein's requirements from relativity. In QFT, particles are treated as quantizations of fields. This allows us to treat space and time equally. And it is still today the best understanding of physics. I have a video on QFT if you want to learn more about it. Note that quantum mechanics, including the Schrodinger equation, is still highly useful. It just has limits to its area of application at high velocities. It's just like we still use Newton's physics to calculate many things. It only has limits close to the speed of light or under high gravitational influence. Another big departure from classical mechanics is the idea of probabilities. The Schrodinger equation has something called a wave function. The wave function of a particle is related to the probability of finding the particle in a given location if you were to measure it. Prior to measurement, we cannot know in advance where it will be. So the outcome is not deterministic. Only the probabilities of the alternative possible outcomes are. This lack of determinism is a complete departure from classical physics where if you know all the forces acting on a particle, you could predict its path. You might say, well, this is the same thing as statistical thermodynamics where statistics are used to describe the motions of molecules in a gas. But in that field, it's just for convenience. Theoretically, the path of every molecule could be determined. It was just not practical. But quantum mechanics is fundamentally different. The positions of particles cannot be determined precisely or predicted in advance. In this sense, the future of the universe is not predetermined in quantum mechanics. The world in the universe would be very different if it was not quantized. It would be a deterministic world where theoretically the future would be predictable. But the world would not exist as we know it because atoms could not form. And if that's the case, then we would have nothing but quantum particles. But if quantum mechanics doesn't exist, then what would we really have? There would be nothing. Since general relativity is not quantum mechanical, you could in principle have a space-time where quantum mechanics doesn't exist but this space-time would be completely empty. There would be no matter, no radiation, and no energy. So there may be a universe where quantum mechanics doesn't exist, but that universe would consist of nothing. And if you have a question, leave it in the comments because I try to answer all of them. I will see you in the next video, my friends.